Hi everyone, um, welcome to a little French town called Ceci, where we are standing literally on top of the CMS detector that is getting ready to take some awesome data today. My name is Claire, I'm a physicist, I work for Formulab and I'm based here at CERN working on the CMS experiment. Hello everyone, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, all of you virtually here uh, today at CMS. I'm Cristina Penades, I'm a mechanical engineer uh, and I work uh, on the integration office of the CMX uh, experiment. So today we are going to take you on a tour of the experimental site. We can't go into the cavern where the detector is located because the LHC has beam in the accelerator right now, um, or they're getting, they're getting ready to put uh, more beam inside uh, right now. But uh, we've got some other areas that we're, we're able to go to, including underground, uh, where you'll be able to see some very cool things, including places that you won't normally be able to go to if you ever come here on a visit. Exactly. To compensate uh, uh, all of you, because, of course, uh, the best way to visit CMS and to experiment is to, is to be on site. It's not possible today. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I will guide you to uh, a spot that even as a visitor on site, you won't be able to to check it out and you will come with me and I will explain you what are the main ch challenges uh, and upgrades that we will do on the following years uh, over CMS. All right, do you want to head on over there now and uh, we'll watch you as you get going through the door? Sure. Okay, see you I'll soon. meet you later on. <laughs> Great. In the meantime, I'm going to keep you all entertained. So behind me is a full scale photograph of a slice of the CMS detector. So just to get an idea of how big this thing really is, let me move all the way back and then you can compare me to the detector. So you can see we are looking for particles that are really, really, really tiny. Oh, I think I lost the microphone at the back there. Um, so you can see that even though we're looking for particles that are really, really, really tiny, we need to build huge, gigantic detectors to see these particles. And that's because inside the LHC, we accelerate the, the protons or in today's case, uh, lead ions. We're accelerating them to the fastest energies that we've ever accelerated things before. And we're smashing them together and you get all sorts of stuff flying outwards. Now, normally at the LHC, most of the time, most of the time, the LHC accelerates protons. So you might know in, in uh, if you have an atom, an atom has protons and neutrons in the center and uh, electrons orbiting around the outside. A hydrogen atom is just one proton, one electron. And for most of the time with the LHC, they start with some hydrogen gas, they get rid of the electrons and they take those protons and they stick them into the accelerator. But this month we started something special. Instead of sending protons into the accelerator, we're taking lead ions. And lead has 82 protons and another 100 and something uh, neutrons all stuck together. I think there's a total of 208 protons and neutrons in one lead ion. And these we're accelerating today and we're smashing together uh, in the center of uh, the CMS detector as well as some of the other detectors to see what's going to happen. Now, um, on the screen over here, I've got a photograph of the, uh, the overview of the, the Fr French uh, Geneva area. And that yellow ring is where the Large Hadron Collider ring is. Of course, it's actually 100 meters underground. Uh, so you can't really see it on the surface. But I'm going to show you the procedure uh, of accelerating stuff into the LHC. So if we come over here. So when we start, we don't just straight away stick things into, uh, stick the protons or the lead ions into the LHC. It actually goes through a number of steps. Uh, for the lead ions, we start with the uh, LEIR accelerator. And then... Um, and then it goes through some boosters and, and this little ring will give them a bit of energy. And then it goes into the super proton synchrotron, which used to be CERN's largest uh, accelerator. Uh, and then these, this will give them a little bit more energy up to 450 GeV this time. And then finally, the lead ions 
get injected into the Large Hadron Collider. And once the accelerator team has filled up the Large Hadron Collider nice and full with uh, bunches of lead ions, then they start accelerating them faster and faster and faster and eventually colliding them. At four points around the ring, these beam, uh, these beam lines cross and you get collisions. And the, the one right up at the top there, that's where we are, that's CMS, uh, which in my completely unbiased opinion is the best of the four big experiments at the LHC. So how are we doing over there? Is, uh, um, are they ready to go down uh, underground? Yeah, Claire, um, I'm uh, here on top of the shop. Do, I, do you mind if I interrupt you? Please go right ahead. Okay, so now we are uh, on the top of the shaft. So this is the communication channel between the surface and the underground cover. Uh, please, Sultan, could you play the video uh, about the lowering of the electrical detector? So this shaft uh, is uh, the major communication channel because it's what we use to lower uh, equipment, heavy equipment underground. One of the big uh, example of this is that in three years from now, we will be uh, upgrading all detectors uh, because uh, LHC is going for the high luminosity program, and thus CMS will do a major transition. Among those major transitions, uh, we will be installing new detectors as the uh, high granularity calorimeter, and uh, to lower these 250 tons uh, detectors, six uh, meter in diameter, we will use this shaft uh, with a specific frame to lower it down uh, the, uh, 100 meters up to the experimental cavern. And now follow me on my journey towards the, the experimental cavern. So in order to enter uh, the cavern, we need to do two checks. Uh, the first one is that I have my uh, personal dosimeter. It will measure all radiation dose uh, accumulated while I'm uh, working on supervised or uh, control areas. Uh, and every month, uh, the, the workers, we, we, need to, we need to scan uh, to prove that we are uh, within the good range. So in order to enter the cover, uh, first I batch my personal dosimeter, and then there will be a, a laser sc and a scan that will scan that is, it's me, I'm not wearing equipment with me because there's a special dose for the equipment. This is only for personal. Uh, and uh, a curious thing is that uh, there will be a biometry check of my iris. If you have seen the movie Angels and Demos, if this is science, fiction it doesn't work like that because in fact you need blood uh, in the eyes to get into it so please uh, follow me um, to get into the experimental cabin so first i batch now i'm entering on the yellow door and i will do the biometric check perfect sometimes uh uh, the system gets rejecting us. Uh, it went very well uh, today. Now, Noemi, my camera, which is behind me, I would like to show also uh, her after because she's uh, doing a great job. She's doing the biometric check again. You are seeing with the camera uh, the, the iris check. And great, she's here with me. OK, so if you were a visitor on the ground, uh, we will give you some uh, helmets for visitors. This is not because it's a uh, shiny color. And... I think we're losing connection uh, right now with the others. So um, I can tell you a little bit about the, the, the detector. In the meantime, we tend to lose signal as they get close to the, the elevator. So while they're busy going underground, I think they'll be going about 88 meters underground, which will take us level with the actual LHC beam pipe. Um, so let uh, me tell you, the... oh, there yeah, we go, they're sure, back go in the on. Go on, Claire. Oh, no, no, tell us about those blue doors. What do we use them for? Yeah, exactly. I was going to mention that uh, if you were here as a visitor, what we will do is to use this blue door to bypass uh, to bypass the system and enter with, uh, with the visitor group. In fact, these blue doors are used to bring equipment uh, from the surface to the cavern also. And also from the cavern out, there's uh, a lot of safety procedures, as you can see here, to make sure that, you know, only people who are uh, 
allowed access into the special underground areas are able to go there, as well as protections for the environment, uh, taking equipment in and out of places that have been close to the LHC beam. So we take uh, safety very, very seriously here. Yeah. Yeah, we will talk a lot about safety today, you will see uh, in many occasions. So now we are uh, on the on the surface level, and in fact, we have two caverns. One is the service cavern that we will be passing by in our journey, and the other one is the experimental cavern, which is where the detector sits. Now we are at the le level zero, and uh, we have three levels. So the first one is minus one, which is uh, minus uh, 80 meters. The second one is at minus 90 meters, and it's the middle uh, the middle of the detector. Uh, usually visitors go to minus two level uh, and then go to the balcony platform, and they are exactly at, at, the, at the beam line height, and it's the best place to observe the detector and, and, be, at the, uh, and be at the experiment. So uh, I'm hey, going to- Great, we'll see you down here. there. So the connection will be lost. Uh, see you on the round in a while. See you down there. Uh, have fun. So um, as uh, as Christina mentioned, we have two caverns. So there's one cavern that holds the detector, and that's literally under my feet. And slightly to my right is uh, the cavern that Christina is going into. And this is the cavern that holds all the services for the detector. One thing that makes CMS special is when they started digging through the ground here to, to excavate, to build the caverns, the ground here was very soft. So they had to add extra concrete reinforcement between these two caverns. You can imagine if you've ever been to a beach trying to dig uh, two holes next to each other in very soft sand, they're going to co collapse in on themselves unless you put uh, some reinforcing in between. So we've got seven meters of concrete in between the experimental cavern where the collisions happen and the service cavern. And this means that you are completely protected from any of the radiation uh, from the, the, the collisions when you're in the service cavern. So we can take visitors down even right now while the LHC beam is running. And that's one thing that makes CMS really special. So let me tell you a little bit about the detector. The point of this beautiful detector uh, that I've got the photo of behind me is to catch and get information from every single particle that moves through the detector that's come out of a collision uh, when we smash protons or, or lead together inside the LHC. And the way we do this is we build the, layer, the, the, the detector in a number of different layers and each layer measures something different. So when we put all of the information together, we're able to tell the difference between different types of particles. If I take a slice, just like a pizza wedge slice out of the detector here, then you can see a schematic uh, on the screen. So the different layers go like this. We, we start off with a tracking detector, which allows particles to move all to travel through and sends little signals along the path, like ding, 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 ding. So we can do a join the dots uh, scenario and we can work out exactly where these particles went. And uh, so we have extra, extra, um, like super high, position uh, precision on the inside there. That tracking detector, that's that inside bit that's colored in gold. Now around the tracking detector, we have detectors that we call calorimeters. And the point of calorimeters is to stop the particles and measure their energy. So imagine, don't do this at home please, but imagine you're driving your car into a brick wall, bam, and then bricks go spraying outwards. You can tell how much energy, how much kinetic energy you had uh, by counting how many bricks they were and how far they got scattered. And it's the same idea in a calorimeter. We stop the particle and instead of a shower of bricks, we get a shower of light and we count up how, many, uh, how much light we got, how many protons, and that tells us the energy of the particle. And then finally, around the outside, so the calorimeters are that are shown in that's the bluish the bluish part in this picture. Then we have a solenoid magnet, so that's that silver ring over there. 
Now, CMS has the, a solenoid magnet with the highest magnetic field in the world. It's 3.8 Tesla. And the point of the magnet is to bend the particles as they travel through, because if you bend them, uh, negatively charged particles will bend in one direction and positively charged particles will bend in the other direction. And you're able to tell the charge of the particle as well as you're able to measure the momentum of the particle. And finally, all the way around the outside, these uh, silver pieces interspersed with red. The red is an iron yoke to help carry the uh, magnetic field from the solenoid all the way through. And the silver parts are kind of like more tracking detectors on the outside, but ones that are specifically designed to catch muons, which are like heavy electrons that make it all the way through the calorimeters without getting stopped. So you can see on the picture from, from different collections of information from the different layers, we are able to tell what uh, different types of particles are. And now- Lovely introduction, Claire. Thank you. Uh, Where are like you now? I'm already on the ground. I'm not Fabulous. cheating. I'm here at 90 meters uh, on the ground. Uh, we are, in fact, in a pressurized area. This means that, uh, on the contrary to an industrial residential building, in case of a, a gas leak or a fire, a smoke will be liberated. Uh, but because of the pressure inside this area, uh, it won't be uh, the so the gas won't come into this place. So this is a safe area. And also the leaf is inside this pressurized area. Area, so in case of an evacuation alarm, you are allowed to use the the leaf. In fact, is the the only way you have because the uh, on the contrary, you will have to take uh, stairs up to 100 meters to the surface, which is not a good idea. So over here we can see also the cameras. These cameras uh, are like the big brother uh, because we have a, on the surface a control room that it's surveying that all areas uh, are in good state and also you can communicate with them in case uh, anything happens on the ground. And uh, all the people that come um, uh, on the ground is trained to use fire extinguisher uh, so we can react uh, uh, in case of any uh, problem happen. So I've now just done the are... fire extinguisher training. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was one of the best ones. Uh, also, the one of the safety rescue masks. I will show it later. Um, and now we are at the bottom of the shaft. So before we were, uh, Noemi can point to the top. We were upstairs. And uh, now you can see that uh, really we are uh, below. So these uh, LEDs, uh, lighting LEDs, uh, it's just artistic representation of the taking of that that happening here on the ground and going to the surface to be analyzed. And uh, normally during shutdown, so in um, this uh, corridor is open. So it's. Oh, it sounds like we're losing a bit of signal uh, from you guys there right now. Uh... All right. Oh, one thing I, don't, I forgot to say earlier, please, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the uh, Q&A so we can answer them. Ah, oh, you're back, Christina. We lost you for a second as you were looking down uh, in the shaft. Okay. Uh, uh, which point uh, did you lose me? Oh, basically, as you pointed the camera downwards to to look down uh, to where the, where the concrete uh, okay. entrance is. Okay, usually. okay. Yeah, I was mentioning that uh, during shutdown periods, during um, uh, not uh, the period where we are not taking data, this is a corridor and it's open for the material to came from the surface to uh, underground. And I was also mentioning that we have two shafts. Uh, this is the smaller one. The biggest one is the one where Claire is uh, standing up, uh, now. And uh, the reason of this is because our experimental cavern is splitting in two halves. Uh, and uh, they, they are both symmetric, so we have the choice to either lower material from one of the ends or lower material from the other end. You have to imagine that the cavern is very large and we actually uh, need these two passages uh, for all the material coming down. And uh, now you can come with me to the brain of the CMS. So we are going to the counting room. So here is very uh, noisy, but uh, I think uh, 
for you it's fine you cannot hear any of the noises uh, around all the noise no, comes from good. the ventilation of the of the racks so one of the first uh, point that we will access is this uh, corridor where we have a uh, racks mainly this is for fiber optics so this is uh, all the cabling the, taking data from the uh, from the detector from a specific one and send the analyzing and sending it to the to the surface you can take a look at the uh, high amount of cabling that we have here and uh, and this is because we need a lot of granularity at CMA uh, to uh, really um, analyze each of the events happen all around the, the surface of the detector. Yeah, so, you know, this is, these are just parts of the, the, the that are powering the detector and providing cooling and providing gases and high voltages. This is not even in parts of the detector itself. It's just all of the additional stuff that we need to keep our detector running. Um, in fact, there's a there's a slide over here, which is a schematic cutout of the CMS detector. Um, and, you know, it's it's a lot of information on the slide. But one of the things that you want to maybe look at is uh, 66 million channels just in the mo in like the very inside tracking detector and another 9.6 million channels in the next few layers of the tracking detector, not to mention readout channels from the calorimeters. And we've got two different calorimeters. We've got four different types of muon detectors. Um, so building something like this is, is an extremely complicated thing from an engineering point of view. And this is uh, what we get to see today is all of these additional bits and pieces that you need to keep a detector like this working at uh, 100%. Right, so we are uh, going now to an area where visitors uh, are not allowed to come. This is a very special area for me because I work uh, a lot uh, around here. This is so cool. I've never you. even been under there. So it's also a surprise for you. So most of the people, when come to CMS, uh, directly go to the experiment and the shiny detector and all the and all the equipment that we have there in the experimental cabin. And this is, of course, very inter interesting. But I wanted to show today what is underneath the detector. And underneath the detector, there is this chaos of and galleries of plenty and um, kilometers of uh, services everywhere you can you can imagine uh, how difficult it is uh, to route uh, one single cable from this service cabin 100 meters far away up to the experimental cabin it's it looks chaotic but in fact all the all the cable trays are identified and we know exactly how many cables uh, are in each of these uh, trays and what is the the length of them that is a very impressive feat. Yeah. At least I show you something new to you also, Claire. Yeah, uh, it's so, so this, cool. This, this gallery are not only for services, but, but for infrastructure in general. Uh, all the gas of the detectors also travel from uh, the gas room, which is in, in our right hand side, or even the cooling uh, of the detectors travel through these galleries. And now we are on top of one of the... Uh, of the galleries that uh, that bring services from the from the uh, service cabin down. Uh, th there is three levels below us up to reach the floor of the detector, and uh, this is uh, one of the special places where we have we will have a lot of uh, work to do in the coming years. So in the coming years, uh, there is a big decommissioning program uh, uh, that we will follow. Many of the existing services will be have to the commission because we, as I mentioned before, we are updating the detectors, but others of the existing services will stay. And the challenge here is to, uh, in a space that was designed for a specific uh, uh, number of services, now we have to uh, pull uh, almost the double. And uh, this is the challenge to bring the new detectors and make them work with existing ones in the in the same location right 
So, you know, as you can see, we've got lines there. We've got uh, high voltages. Some of the muon detectors uh, sit at 16,000 volts. Uh, we have gases uh, such as liquid helium, uh, which we use to cool our solenoid magnet because it's a superconducting magnet. We have carbon dioxide, which is used in the tracking detector. So this must make it uh, pretty dangerous down there, Christina. What do we what do we do to protect ourselves? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, to come uh, underground here, there is all the specific trainings that we have to follow. And uh, also one of the um, uh, funniest training that, training that we do is the safety uh, rescue mask. So this is the, this box here that uh, we have to wear with us. Uh, and uh, in case of a uh, gas relic, uh, it could be alien, it could be CO2, we we open the box and as uh, my dear friend Tom is here, we we put this um, this tube and we have thirty minutes uh, of oxygen. This uh, creates a reaction that gives you oxygen for thirty minutes, and you are allowed to. And with this, you you can uh, go to one of the escape uh, routes that you have. And uh, this uh, red uh, door that we have here is in fact the access to the LXC tunnel. Uh, but not only. Uh, let me show you in this picture. So we were here. So, uh, you, you can see the two caverns. So this is the experimental cavern, while this is the service cavern. And we were here in the in the lift. So we came all the way uh, up to this point. And uh, this is the red door. And you can see uh, exactly how the red doors communicate with the LXC tunnel. But also, uh, it's a uh, a second evacuation path to a new, another leaf. If I'm here and something happens and I cannot co uh, come back to the leaf I was showing before, I have a second escape route to, to uh, another leaf. But if we open that red door and the beam is running, then the safety mechanisms kick in and dump the beam um, to protect us. But so, you know, we that will make people very angry with us if we don't have a very very good reason for doing so so yeah, but we try to it. <laughs> okay uh follow me um you were the visitor uh normally we will go through this uh, yellow door now not possible uh, there is no act there because uh, as claire mentioned we are taking data but uh, still the magnet on and uh, we would like to have. We're losing signal over there again. I think they're the getting pretty much pretty close to the magnetic okay. field. Um, in the meantime, we have a question saying, sure. when would so we see where collisions? I am, where I am. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just answer a question quickly. One of the questions I uh, was asked, uh, asking sure. when we would see collisions. When the LHC is running in this per run period, which starts from springtime and goes to autumn, the LHC tries to run as close to 24 hours a day, seven days a week as possible. Right now, there's a there's a live screen. In fact, anybody can get it. Type in LHC page one on Google, and you will get this uh, picture, this uh, this this page uh, that's showing here. And it's got a bunch of information. But what this is telling us is ion physics. That means that the machine is getting ready to put uh, lead ions in. And cycling means that they're doing a, a cycle of the magnets. We've got 9,000 magnets and 1,200 of them are specifically designed just to keep the beam going around in a circle. Cycling means that we take these magnets all the way up to their full field and back down again to make sure that they're all in the best possible you know, configuration uh, for us to get beam into the LHC. So they're doing this now. Cycling can take, you know, maybe a, a, a half an hour or so, another half an hour to inject, another half an hour to ramp up the energy, and then we can start seeing collisions there. So probably not now, but if you continue watching that screen, when it says ion physics stable beams, that's when you know we've got collisions. Christina, how are you doing over there? What do you see? Yeah, so... Yeah, so I'm back here. 
So um, uh, here, where we are at this moment, we have about seven uh, millitesla. And uh, I'm not uh, cheating, so to show you that this is uh, right, I will play with this uh, little ruler. So we've got a really, really high tech detector on, on the, the other side of that wall from Christina called CMS. And in her hand, Christina has it's, another uh, very high tech like, detector. Okay, so uh, this is just a little game, but uh, when working on the ground, you can you can hope to be uh, when work. The magnetic field will be much more stronger and can attract uh, the tools that can damage something. Non-magnetic field, um, non-magnetic uh, tools. Another little game that we can play here. We love to play with the the magnet. You see that this. Uh, So we can, we're about 20 meters away from the magnet and right there where she is, we can still feel and see the effects of the magnetic field using paper clips. Um, it seems like, yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go. We've got them back right now. Um, do you want to hold up the, those paper clips that we, we dropped out? Um, we, we keep dropping out from the signal over there. Uh, maybe uh -huh. hold them up again so we can, we can. Yeah, see. sorry. I thought you were listening to me. So yeah, I was saying that uh, I just have this uh, very simple uh, uh, magnetic clips uh, line, which is not magnetized. And in fact, you can see that uh, in this area, a bit far away from the from the detector, it, it's not. But as soon as I approach, uh, you can see this pointy end, how it gets oriented to follow the magnetic uh, field lines. And it even gets exact there. Another little plane that I like to do, so this is aluminum and is uh, not uh, magnetic, but uh, the bolts they are. So I can play with this and uh, the clips uh, really stays. It's not me That's holding. Really cool. It's pretty cool, yeah? Yeah, we always love, 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 love to make this uh, little game. Like physicists, um, you know, we, we build these gigantic big detectors, but actually all we need is a magnetic field and some paper clips to make us happy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, also if you are a bit lazy and your clips uh, fall down and you don't want to collect them, you can just pick them this funny way I'm doing now. And, and in fact, you see many, many clips uh, all around. But this only holds in a specific region because as soon as I approach, uh, as I get a bit far away, it just a uh, lot the magnetism. Yeah, so you really see the gradient of the uh, magnetic field there. I suppose it could be a fun little uh, physics problem if you wanted to calculate the weight of a paperclip and how many, uh, you, you know, how far away you could you could carry seven paperclips or something. Yeah, in fact, you can calibrate uh, and you can feel if there is variation of, of the on the magnets um, with these very simple clips. And uh, just as an anecdote, uh, I can tell you that the first time that I came in the experimental cabin, I was wearing my safety shoes, which uh, they have some uh, metallic uh, protection, and I was feeling uh, every step how they get uh, towards the 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 beams, uh, the metallic beams on, on the balcony. And it's a curious experience to 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 be how your foot are attracted and somehow you don't know how to walk in, anymore because you you feel the the magnetic field taking your feet uh, towards the towards the beam. That that's amazing. In fact, actually, a couple of weeks ago there was uh, no beam for a while, and I had to go into the cavern to change a power supply. So I had a little toolkit with me with screwdrivers and things. And as I walked past the detector, this thing kept on trying to turn and point itself uh, into the magnetic, in, into the center of the uh, of the detector, aligning with the magnetic field. Uh, so it's a lot of fun to to work here yeah. just from uh, just from an engineering perspective. By the way, there's a question. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, how do you get involved um, in internships and things? So CERN has a lot of programs. There are summer student programs. Um, but one of the easiest things to do is to contact you know your local university, either like physics department, and just find out if anybody is involved in uh, any of the physics. Uh, at CERN, it doesn't have to necessarily be CMS, although we're the best. 
um, but there are many, many different experiments here and you know, many different uh, universities and labs across the world are working on them. So I hope to see you here soon in the future. So there's also the, so the, the door that said Higgs boson. Yeah, that, that's a funny poster. That's actually, that's actually by the elevator. So that was the elevator that came out. I think that's a poster that was left over from one of the open days. And it, so here's a fun fact about Higgs bosons. When we're smashing protons together inside of the LHC. Claire, um, uh, just oh, to inform you, yes. we are uh, going um, up to the... To You're going up to minus one. Excellent. Okay, they're going up to minus one. Anyway... Fun fact about the Higgs boson, it takes, Higgs, Higgs bosons are pretty rare events. Uh, about one in every billion collisions produces a Higgs boson. But the Higgs boson lives for, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second before it transforms into other particles that actually live long enough to go through our detector. So we never see a Higgs boson. We see, for example, four electrons instead. Um, but if you add up the combined mass of those four electrons, then that is, uh, that's the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, oh, there's an event picture. Uh, he, no, not that one. Oh, hold on. Ah. There. Is this a Higgs, a Higgs event? So in this event, ah, this actually, it, well, this is a candidate event where you have a Higgs boson giving off two electrons, which are shown by those big green spiky things that just shows you've got a lot of energy in each of the calorimeters. And then the two red lines going through those red panels, those are the muon detectors. So we've got two muons, two electrons. Um, and if you add up the masses of those four together, it ends up being uh, around the mass of the Higgs boson. So this is a very nice candidate Higgs boson event. You know, in physics, we never can say with 100% certainty that this was a Higgs or was not a Higgs. But uh, what we do is we, this is why we need to take lots and lots of data. We, uh, instead of, we can't prove anything with just one. We take a whole bunch uh, of pictures like this and then what we should do is we should see a collection uh, of them that look uh, that look like Higgs bosons, and if the collection like matches what our theory predicts, we should see. Then that gives us confidence that our that our theory is correct. Oh, where are you now, Christina? Hello, uh, we are back uh, here. We are on the level above that we were before, so this is level minus one. And you can see this uh, empty room uh, where, there, in fact, there is now work ongoing, refurbishment, the, the floor. And uh, this area will be very special in the upcoming years and of critical importance because here, what you see now as an empty room, uh, maybe you can put the, the slide of the two pack head cooling plant room that I mentioned to you before. So it will be transformed in three years to become uh, what you are seeing on the slide. So let me tell you that the new generation of detector will be silicon based and uh, to in order for this detector to withstand the uh, radiation hard environment the long term uh, the long term condition they need to be cool at sub zero temperature for that uh, we are using uh, co2 as a coolant and uh, some of the advantages of co2 is that uh, uh, they are um, very good uh, in, in thermally. Uh, they are also uh, working very well in uh, small pipes uh, because you know that the first letter of our experiment is compact and uh, to integrate on the cooling uh, element, one of the requirements is also to be compact. So CO2 can, uh, be, uh, can work well uh, thermally in very small uh, diameter pipes and also respect the it's environmentally friendly. So this will be the cool uh, the cooling room where the the eight plants of each of the detectors um, will be held. And here we will pump uh, the CO2 uh, through uh, from from the cooling plants up to the different uh, points of the of the detector. 
Christina, when you said this was environmentally friendly, I mean, we're talking about carbon dioxide here, but all of this is inside a closed loop, right? You're recycling this. Uh, we're not getting any of these gases out into the atmosphere. Exactly, exactly. Cool, uh, excellent. And it's uh, quite uh, curious uh, to know uh, how we will uh, how we will be sending the CO2 from this uh, room to the experiment. In fact, we will be using coaxial piping. So there will be one inner piping with the CO2 at sub cool uh, temperature at a constant uh, pressure and the constant temperature that will be pumped up to the detector. So that will be the active part of the detector electronics uh, that will evaporate uh, this uh, this liquid into a two-phase um, vapor uh, liquid that will be uh, come back in a coaxial piping. So in fact, we will have two pipings in one, the inlet and the outlet inside of the same uh, pipe. And to isolate all that, it will be isolated by a, a vacuum. So there's no heat transmitted to the outside. That's awesome. That, yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you that uh, the cooling temperature will be minus 35, which is quite challenging uh, for the big sizes and, and uh, pow uh, cooling power that we are talking about. This cooling room will be uh, uh, the uh, will have a cooling power of 150 kilowatts, so quite impressive and very novel technology. And this is all in preparation for the high luminosity LHC, which is basically the upgrade to the LHC that we're going to start uh, working on in about 2026. Is that correct? Correct. We will start the major upgrade in 2026. However, at the end of this year and at the end of the next year, so 2024 and 2025, we will start in some of the uh, major preparation programs also. So I'm going back to surface. All right, excellent. Uh, See you up here. Yeah. See yeah, so, you up there. Oh, uh, so, so the LHC, we started the LHC running in 2020, uh, 2010. And what we've been doing since then is actually increasing the energy um, in, in steps between the different uh, runs of the LHC. So now when the protons uh, are colliding, they are colliding at 13.6 trillion uh, electrovolts of energy. Anyway, um, now the next step, so the energy that you can accelerate the, the the particles to inside the machine depends on your magnets because you need the magnets to keep the to bend them around inside the 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 circular ring so you you need a particular strength magnet to be able to bend the protons or or the ions around in this ring so with the magnets that we've got, we've basically reached the, the limit of energy, but that doesn't mean we can't, we can't still push things forward. So in the upgrade, what we're going to do is we're going to increase the number of protons or that collide uh, every second. Normally, well, as of, you know, earlier this year, when we were colliding protons, we would get something like 60 protons colliding all at the same time, every 25 nanoseconds, we would have 60 protons colliding. Uh, and there's actually a really nice, no, wait, where is it? Ah, hold on, I've got to go to the right. Okay, I'm giving up. Um, anyway, when we go to the high luminosity upgrade, we're gonna go from 60 protons every 25 nanoseconds to 200 protons every 25 nanoseconds. Now, most of those are actually not particularly interesting stuff, but it just gives us extra signal that our detector has to be able to say, this is the interesting one and these other 59 are not interesting. Or in the future, uh, this is the interesting one and these other 199 are not the particularly interesting one. So our software and our detector and everything, our, our electronics have to be able to handle this flood of data. In fact, we get so much data coming out of the detector that we literally cannot store it all. If you imagine standing in front of a waterfall, that is like the amount of data that we just are getting out of the detector. And you have a cup and, and that cup is how much data you can store. So 
you have to be, you know, you have to be quite clever in deciding which particular cup of water, which which particular cup of data we are going to store um, and hope, and you know, you want to work this out so that the interesting events like Higgs bosons or potential dark matter signatures are in these this data that you're storing and not the data that you are having to throw away. Um, so are there any other questions uh, online? We've had a few, let's see if there's anybody we can, we can ask anything about the physics, about heavy ions. Do we discover antimatters at CMS? Yes. So actually, antimatter is completely normal stuff. Um, for every, it, it's conservation laws. So every time you have uh, a, a collision um, from conservation, if I produce a positively charged particle, then I'm going to produce a negatively charged particle uh, with it. In fact, that picture that I showed you earlier of the Higgs boson event with it was an electron and a positron, an anti-electron, and a muon and an anti-muon. Um, so antimatter is, is very normal stuff, and we see it all the time in our detectors. Another fun thing about antimatter is we actually have an antimatter factory here at CERN. It's not part of the LHC complex, but what they do in the antimatter factory is Unlike the LHC, where we're trying to speed up the particles, we have an antiproton decelerator where we're slowing the uh, particles down. So we, we take antiprotons, slow them down, and then add an anti-electron to make an anti-hydrogen atom. And just this week, uh, there's been a really, really exciting result that has come out from one of the uh, experiments at the antimatter factory. Because one thing that you, you might have wondered over the course of your life is, does antimatter fall downwards in gravity? And, you know, it's got mass, so you think, yes, it, it should. But up until this week, nobody had ever actually done the experiment to answer that question. And uh, earlier this week, the alpha experiment produced a result uh, where they literally made took antiatoms of hydrogen and dropped them and watched to see whether they fell downwards or upwards. And I'm not going to tell you the answer. Uh, you should go and look up the answer to see if uh, to find to find the result. Um, okay, so how can we make sure that our system does not exclude interesting data? So this is a very, very good question. We have teams of people working on this. It's called the trigger. Um, so we have we have teams of people working on what we call trigger rules to select events that we expect to have the signature of interesting stuff. Um, and and so it it there's like an automatic signal to store this data based on what the signals look like in the detector. And in fact, in the control room, one of the shifters is a trigger shifter who is exactly. paying attention to this all of these where things. I'm on, this is exactly. where I am now at this moment. So we are in the control room and uh, we have the different uh, positions here at the control room. Uh, this is the shift leader position. Uh, this is the, the location. Hello, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. This, this people is very busy and we are filming now at uh, this moment. So this is uh, in um, in communication with, with the LXC control room. And uh, this is the screens that uh, Claire was showing before. At this moment, we, we are ion physics cycling um, and the, the machine is closing. But normally, this is the data that we see here. So we see the two beams intensity and we see the uh, integrated luminosity by, taken by each of the detectors. Another of the uh, positions that we have here is the data acquisition, where we see all the particle events or, or the interested events that are happening now and are on the moment uh, being analyzed by the, by the experts. And uh, on the, on the right-hand side, we have the, um, the technical shifter. And uh, these are the screens that you see, several hundred of the screens. And this is, in fact, uh, taking care of the safety of the detector. So we check that all cooling, it's green, that there's no leaks, there is no any problem going around. Uh, we also check the gas status. We also check the, the, the alarms happening of the detector. 
uh, alarms, uh, for instance, related to oxygen de deficiency or overpressure or any any other uh, the sensors that we have around. You can also see the cameras that are surveying uh, the underground areas. And uh, from here is where you can communicate with someone underground and they can help you to bypass the, the doors or so ever. <clears throat> And uh, yes, sorry, I almost forget. So this is the screen showing the magnet, the magnet status. You can see that we are uh, 18,000 amps uh, uh, running now uh, on the magnet. Uh, if you know what is an amp, this is extremely, extremely uh, high current going through it at this uh, moment. And exactly, we have the 3.8 uh, Tesla. And uh, on the other side of the room, uh, what we have is the, um, the the position of each of the detector. This uh, each of the detectors has a workstation where they survey the status of the of the detector. So we have ICAL, we have CSCs, we have RPCs, and uh, these people uh, sometimes they are the doing tests or sometimes there is a channel loss and they need to uh, align or, or correct uh, the the status of their chambers to to be in the good shape for taking data excellent and yes i think uh the trick the i think that is uh an indian uh, guy, uh, person who is uh, the trigger shifter um today this afternoon uh, we have collaborators from all over the world and there are a bunch of Indian universities working uh, as collaborators on CMS so yeah we have a strong uh, Indian component uh, in in the collaboration there are about 4,000 people in total uh, working on this experiment so we've got a nice uh, slice of nationalities from all over the world I myself am South African actually um, so, so we have some other questions about about antimatter and elements. So, in terms of making elements at CERN, so we can make antiprotons and antihydrogen at the antimatter factory. Um, we don't really make things like plutonium, although there is a facility called Isolde who produces uh, radioisotopes. Uh, which are then used uh, for various applications and also for studying different uh, different things about the radioisotopes. So we can do that. Um, but you know, capturing and storing antimatter is actually particularly difficult uh, because, well, first of all, if you take uh, antimatter and it touches normal matter, then it's going to annihilate in, in a in a burst of energy. So. If you want to store antimatter, first of all, you have to store, have a vacuum, and then you have to have a magnetic field to sus hold the particles suspended in this vacuum so it doesn't touch the sides of the container that it's in. Um, and now, of course, if, it's a mag if, if you're using a magnetic field to hold something, it can only hold charged particles. So something like an antihydrogen atom is even more difficult because it's neutral. So you basically have to if you're the, in, in the antimatter factory where they produce these things, they're producing them at rest. And it's actually a very, very, it's, it's harder to slow things down and stop them than it is to accelerate them up to 99.9999991% uh, the speed of light. Um, yeah. Oh, so here's a question um, about the Higgs boson. So how does the Higgs boson, which gives mass to stuff, have mass itself? That's a really excellent question. And it's uh, a particular property of the Higgs boson that, well, okay. So we're gonna get a little bit technical here, bear with me. So you have, in, in, in particle physics, we tend to talk about everything as particles, but actually what, we, what we're thinking about when we're thinking about the Higgs is there's, there's a field called the Higgs field. Hello, welcome back. <laughs> So there's a Higgs field which permeates, you know, the entire universe and it's interactions between the particle and the Higgs field that gives them, that gives the particles uh, its mass. Now the Higgs boson is special because it can interact with itself. The Higgs boson interacts with the Higgs field and that is how the Higgs boson can have mass. Um, another prob another interesting question actually is 
why does the Higgs boson have less mass than the heaviest particle, which is the top quark? And that is a question that we actually don't know the answer to. Um, and you know, we 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 thought that supersymmetry uh, would be a great theory to explain that. So we've been on the hunt for supersymmetric particles for for a while now, but we haven't seen any yet. So we're kind of uh, we're kind of scratching our heads at the moment uh, as to why the you know why the Higgs boson is less than the top quark. So that was super fun. Thank you so much for that tour. It was my pleasure. Do we have uh, any more question for the audience? Uh, so here's a question. What is the process after colliding or accelerating any particle? Um, I'm not sure what, what uh, process they're, they're asking about uh, there. Um, so the collisions themselves happen every 25 nanoseconds in case of protons uh, or every 50 nanoseconds uh, in case of the lead. And basically, this is just happening continuously. For about 12 straight hours, the LHC just has the has these protons going around in the circle and, and colliding. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything more. Yeah, uh, dump, just maybe. to add that for accelerating the particle, the principle, it's uh, very simple. And it's, it's in fact um, a change in, um, you attract a particle and then the, you reject it. So at the end, you get a, an acceleration of this particle. Yeah. And then after about 12 hours, um, you know, there's still a lot of protons in the machine, but we, we're kind of using up the beam. Um, and so the intensity goes down a bit. So the machine team will usually dump the beam then and then fill up again with a nice fresh batch of protons or lead. All right, we have we have a person who is 17 and really wants to work at CERN. So what advice would you give them? Well, uh, you can see that at CERN, um, you can pursue physics uh, career, but also an engineering career. And uh, we can be almost at 50-50 at CERN, I would say. Also, we have a lot of technicians because we need hands-on to, to, to develop all the ideas and to make them reality. So you can see there is a wide variety of, of, um, of backgrounds that you can, uh, you can adapt. Uh, we need architects to build assembly halls like this one. Uh, we, need, we need a uh, lot of administra administrative persons. We uh, need people to dig tunnels and do cabling uh, and all of that stuff, as well as, you know, the physics, which is sort of the last step in that whole chain. We can't do any of the physics without uh, all of the other people involved. Um, how much does it cost to, well, it's, it's a bit hard to say per collision because there's so many collisions. There's like 40 million collisions, uh, you know, per second. So it, it, it basically costs zero because anything divided by that huge number is going to be zero. Um, but more practically, so CERN is funded by the member states of CERN. Um, and what happens is the member states contribute uh, some portion of their GDP to CERN, and this goes to help CERN running the accelerator. Um, the detectors are, are funded uh, separately by their collaborations. Um, but, you know, a way that CERN pays this back to the community is that uh, all the member states, so if you're, if you're part from a member state, you can come and work at CERN, and companies from member states can tender exactly. for, for projects like digging the next big tunnel. Yeah, there is a lot of industrial return because uh, the the companies from the member state um, countries um, can come here and, um, and work with CERN, not only to uh, state-of-the-art uh, technology, but also to develop new technology that later on it's uh, applied uh, on the industry or, or even in the mechanical and the medical field. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool. And then, of course, another thing that CERN uh, does is because this money really, it's, it's taxpayer money. So what what CERN does is, is if you want to come and visit CERN, you are absolutely welcome to visit CERN for free. You know, you can go on tours. You can see the exhibitions. There's a brand new exhibition center opening next month. It's going to be beautiful. And everything is always free for people because essentially you've already paid for it. Uh, in your taxes by helping us keep this running. Yeah. And so, we have open data policy too. Yeah, and also if you are planning uh, for a visit, 
uh, try to book uh, from November to March because are the months uh, where we are not taking data and all the underground facilities are accessible. So yeah, and then you you'll will be profit able to, the, yeah. the maximum of that. Then you'll be able to go and see that thing, you know, it, for real. So I think we need to start wrapping up uh, right now. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us. It was it was great. And thank you so much, Christina, for that amazing tour. Oh, and um, we have uh, we have we asked uh, people who registered to complete a survey. So uh, we had some feedback uh, from the survey over here that I think we need to just go through. Um, so let's let's see what the survey is telling us. Oh. Oh, so uh where Okay. What? Oh, the link, yeah. The link is up. So uh just for our information and so you know we can plan to maybe do this more in the future if you if you could fill out the survey that would be awesome. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for visiting CMS with us uh, today. Hope to see you uh, in person in another moment. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, everyone. And have an excellent rest of your Friday and rest of your researchers night and weekend. Bye. Bye.